the polling uh, that's been done on British Muslim views do show very quite disparate differences compared to non the wider non-Muslim public. Attitudinal differences. Yes. Yeah. Another thing is, uh, I think that Muslim identity is a, is a, at odds with British liberal identity, Western liberal identity. Okay. Uh, welcome, welcome. Where are we today, sir? Uh, we're in Earl's Court, London. We're in. What is your name? Uh, Eric Kaufman. Excellent. And you're a professor of politics. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. And hello, sir. How are you today? Hi, Peter. I'm well. Uh, excellent. And what is your name? Andy Ngo. Excellent. Best-selling author. Yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. Well, we're going to not talk about anything controversial today, so everybody <laughs> just can just relax. Muslim prayer. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing controversial. Everybody remain calm. Okay. Muslim prayer rituals should be banned from public schools. Muslim prayer rituals should be banned from public schools. Five, four, three, two, one, move. In the UK, Muslim prayer rituals should be banned from public schools in the UK. Wow. Eric is on well, the. Maybe I'll the Eric is on the agree. agree. You are welcome to stay on neutral. So, oh, you're both on the agree. Why say? Agree? So why? No, oh, you're oh you're on the strongly agree. So why are you on the strongly agree? Uh, I strongly agree with this, the statement. It's inflammatory to many, but I. I'm of the rather non-controversial view that state schools should be secular in how they function. Okay, and why are you on the agree? I mean, in this country, you've got a lot of schools that are Church of England or Catholic, but they're within the public system. So they are public schools. You don't have to be a Catholic to go to a Catholic school. So I think in those schools, because they already have a religious ethos, it's okay to have some accommodations for other religions. I don't think that's okay in the bulk of the system, however, which is secular. When the ethos there, I think, has to be uh, you know, a secular national ethos where it's an emphasis on commonality, common enlightenment values, and not on religious difference. Okay, all right, go back to the neutral line. So I got this claim from Matt Goodwin. There should be a five-year moratorium on immigration to the UK. Move. Yeah, this is a, this is a, this is a tricky one. So Andy, you're in slightly agree, and Eric, you're on disagree. Why do you disagree? Well, I, I, I don't agree with going to zero. But I do agree with much lower levels. So, I mean, perhaps if you want to go to 50,000, something really low. But it's just, just in the course of a year, you know, your citizens will marry, may have a strike up a relationship with somebody else, and those people have to be naturalized. And, and I just think it's, it's unrealistic. And also, you know, there may be some refugee claims that are valid and, and that you're willing to take. You know, I think a low number, but not zero, is kind of where I would go. And is it, correct me if I'm wrong, but is it 700,000 a year currently? Currently, it's uh, yeah, 720,000, I think, is the year. 720, okay. This, it was the total for this year. So that's, that's... That's legal or illegal? That's legal. And that mm. is, uh, well, the last two years, six and 700, have been over twice as large as right. anything that's right. happened ever. So, right. I mean, this is really unprecedented waters that we're in. Okay, and so you're on slightly agree to the claim of a five-year moratorium. My view as somebody who's currently not a citizen uh, is that the views of citizens should be respected, and the British public over and over do not want mass migration. All migrants make equal contributions to the UK regardless of where they came from. So it doesn't matter where they come from, all migrants make the same contribution to the society. Move. Wow, now that is, that is, that is interesting. You're both on strongly disagree. We got the coin. You want to call it? Okay, heads. Heads it is. So you have a choice. You can go to the opposite line and argue it, or you can f force him to go to the opposite line and make him argue it. <laughs> Poor Andy. Um, <laughs> 
Andy, I'm afraid I'm going to have to send you away. <laughs> okay. 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 So you are now going to be forced to argue something you don't believe, and the claim is all migrants make equal contribution to the UK regardless of where they come from. Okay, so what is, tell him your best argument for this. Best argument is there have been studies, we have data that uh, migrants from certain countries, uh, yeah, just take an extreme case, migrants from Germany versus migrants from Somalia, how they do in Britain in terms of contribution to the, the fiscal pot versus what they take from the pot over their lifetime, there's a massive difference. And so, yeah, all countries- Who takes more, the Somalis or the Germans? <laughs> so, so the Somali contribution would be considerably less than the German one. They would probably be, it would be a net cost to the treasury, whereas the sort of German, French type migrant would be a net benefit. Well, what if they made another kind of contribution to the society? Yes, that the, if that was the case, then I, we have to factor that in, into the calculation. And of course, I'm just I'm saying talking, that that's where I think he might go with this. Yeah, and of course, you've got we're talking averages. We're not talking every individual. You know, right. um, you know, you're, I'm sure there's the odd French scrounger and the odd you know Somali surgeon or whatever. But what? But on average, okay, uh, yeah, okay, all right, Andy. Now you're in an uncomfortable position because you lost the coin toss of arguing for a position that you do not believe, just to be clear about that. So all migrants make equal contributions to the UK regardless of where they come from. If someone actually believed that, and the problem is we simply cannot get people who believe any leftist orthodoxy to come in and talk to us, they refuse. Um, what, what would the argument be for someone who was standing there? Gosh, you make this really hard for me because the the state the claim, the statement here is, is an empirical one, but setting that aside, I suppose um, I can make a, appeals to anecdotes of individuals whose parents have come from failed states or failing states who have gone on to flourish and contribute a lot to society. I mean, just speaking for from my own background, you know, my my parents came with uh, my mother had a high school education. My father was educated to, I think, maybe around 14 years old or so. Uh, so they came to the United States as refugees with no education, no money, literally nothing, and have, through the years, was able to establish a business in Portland, Oregon. From Vietnam. Correct, from, from Vietnam, which, I mean, when, when South Vietnam, which then failed to, uh, was a, a mm -hmm. state that was taken over by communists. So, so anecdotes, so your evidence for this, someone who believed that standing there, they would give anecdotal evidence of individuals who succeeded independently of the culture in which they live. Yeah, I mean, those and those type of stories are really powerful. You think of the doctor you know, the friend you have, uh, maybe an in-law, somebody you married who's, whose families come, maybe have come from very difficult backgrounds have gone on to do very well in the host country. The most valuable contribution a migrant can make to the UK is to the treasury. The most valuable contribution a migrant can make to the UK is to the treasury. Move. Oh, you're both on disagree. Why do you disagree? Well, I, th I think it's very important that they culturally assimilate. Uh, that's more, in many ways, more important than the economics for me. If you were going to create a kind of ranking to see who successfully integrates from what countries and what does not, like what metrics would you look for? Like treasury would be one. I would imagine crime statistics would be another. What would another be? Well, uh, when you s depends what you mean by integration. <laughs> So, okay. so I would, I'm quite favorable to what I call, what I would say is that assimilation is not this, is a deeper thing than integration. Okay. So in integration, you get a job, you vote, you, you become part of society, you, you queue and you do various things. That's different from taking on the identity of the whole society in a deep way, which I think is the only ultimately long lasting way the society can retain its identity and cohesion. Okay. Okay. Go back to the neutral, please. New claim. It is possible for most Muslims in the UK to assimilate to UK culture within 30 years. It is possible for most Muslims in the UK to assimilate to UK culture within 30 years. Move. Andy, don't look at him. <laughs> Everybody make their own. Yeah. You're neutral. You're, why are you neutral? 
because it's 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 con competing things. So I think that if you mean speaking the language, getting a job, being attached to Britain, participating in politics, I'd say yes. Um, How many Muslims are in the United, Her Majesty's Armed Forces now? I don't know. There will be some, though. There will be some, especially given there's different shades of Muslims. There's, especially if you consider secularized, like Kurds, somebody like that, to be a Muslim, then then yes, right. Um, but I think however, it's around 450. Okay, okay. Yeah. But I think the, uh, the, the issue I have is that I think that you can have a certain number of people, that th th the Muslim identity competes at some level with a sort of particularly an ethnic British identity. So you would always have a, divi a divided oh. kind of, a, a, a lo not loyalty, but a divided identity. And, and that's fine. You can have a certain amount of that in your society, but if you have too much of it, I think that's a loss in terms of cohesion. Okay, so let's accept by fiat that everything everything you said is true. That would seem that you should be on the slightly disagree, even the disagree line, no? Yeah, and it, it all depends what we mean by assimilation. And this is a bit into splitting academic hairs, right? So I, my view is that unless there is a majority of the population that identifies themselves with the main ethnic group in the society, okay. that you're going to have weaker social cohesion, okay. but you don't have to have everybody to identify okay. that way, right? Okay. You're less Pollyanna than the professor. Than the professor. Yes. Why? Um, well, I actually, I probably would be on strongly disagree if I had just on hand more of the data. So not having the numbers memorized right now, I think, I mean, 30 years is, is one generation. And the polling uh, that's been done on British Muslim views, do you show very quite disparate differences compared to non the wider non-Muslim public? Attitudinal differences. Yes. Yeah. Another thing is, uh, I think that Muslim identity is a, is a, at odds with British liberal identity, Western liberal identity. How uh, so? Well, Islam, according to the Quran, has a number of truth claims that are also tied through other texts and, and traditions about how society and the family should be oriented that are fundamentally at odd with British values. And so, I mean, even as a, under the, the Cameron-led um, government before, as they were trying to define what British values were in the face of all these British Muslims joining IS or expressing support for terrorism and or carrying out terrorist jihadist attacks, I mean, they had to water down British identity to be quite sort of meaningless things like tolerance and diversity and multiculturalism in order to be able to fit British Muslims within that. So I think that just kind of demonstrates that there there is this this clash and, and uh, one side is, is, is going to dominate over the other. Uh, is, uh, did you agree with what he said? Is there anything that you would convince you about the incompatibility of Islam with civil society or certainly yeah. the extremist versions of that? Well, I extremist versions of Islam are definitely incompatible with you know, the ethos of, of Britain, the kind of liberal uh, civil religion of the country, yes. The question, I suppose, is, is these are all kind of shades. You know, you've got, there are very kind of secular Muslims who drink and who, you know, don't pray five times a day, and then you've got the Salafis on the other side. And, and there's a certain spectrum, although probably Andy's right that a significant chunk of Muslims, South Asian Muslims in this country, uh, are quite traditional in their beliefs, and I think you can see this, particularly in the mill towns, where you have the kind of cousin marriages, which are form like a third or a half of, of all marriages, and so that I think is fundamentally incompatible. But I guess the question is a, a light assimilation to, you know, in terms of not committing crime, loyalty to the state, participating in the economy, is probably possible. And this is why I say, you know, it's like in the U.S., you can have a small number of Amish, or in Israel, you can have a certain percentage of ultra-Orthodox, if they take over your society, you're done. So you kind okay. so that's the diff that's what I mean is as long as there's small numbers, that's fine. It's it's tolerable and it won't impact the functioning of the society. Once it gets above a certain level, okay. then no. You have anticipated my next question. Okay. Back to the neutral, please. Okay. So right now the Muslim population is around six percent. By twenty fifty it's gonna be seventeen percent, eighteen percent. When the Muslim population reaches eighteen percent, the inhabitants should surrender. 
Move. <laughs> the inhabitants should surrender. Okay. Back to the neutral, please. When the Muslim population reaches 50%, the inhabitants should surrender. Move. Okay, you're on disagree. Fascinating. Back to the neutral, please. When the Muslim population reaches 75%, because it's also, you can also think about it, more kids at younger ages, the inhabitants should surrender. Move. Okay, I'm, I'm confused. Explain why they, the inhabitants shouldn't surrender. Well, I think, I think, um if everything you said before was true, there's a fundamental incompatibility, and now you have 70% of the people who are against f the, the basic principles of a secular liberal society. So what would the alternative be but to surrender? Because at that point, deportation is impossible. I think maybe this is sort of just a, my emotional commitment to want to see Britain perpetuate beyond... Uh, uh, on on these lands, and so I I have this commitment that you um, sh should not should never surrender, even if it's a futile battle. To me, even if you lose, um, trying trying to think more rationally. I mean, you know, there there comes a a point where culturally society has shifted to a point where um, one side has dominance over the, the other. Um, I can understand the the argument for giving up at that point and establishing life okay. perhaps somewhere else. Okay, go to the neutral, please. It is possible for the UK to be entirely Muslim and secular. Move. Entirely Muslim and secular. Um... I mean, I suppose in a, a certain version of this, okay, there's, there's a certain version. I, I want to take the other side from Andy's. No, no, but, but yeah, is yeah. that what you actually believe? Go, go mean, where you believe. It's very tricky because if, if these are people who believe in Islam, then it's impossible. Okay, so you should okay, be okay, on the strong okay. disagree. <laughs> okay, so you're on the strong disagree. Okay. <laughs> okay, so it, then explain to me what I'm missing about why, if, if you would lose the secular society, then it's just, just a question of how, at what point in the population do you get before you surrender? I mean, I don't see any other way around that. Yeah, one doesn't entail the other. You can be completely outnumbered, but fight to the last man. Or, you know, so it doesn't, it, the moral injunction to surrender doesn't necessarily follow from being in a minority. That's, that's the only point that I would make. So, do you agree with him? Yes. Okay, back to the neutral line, please. It is possible for Islam to be reformed in order to be compatible with secularism and liberalism. Move. You're still thinking about it. You can still think about it. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. That was a radical, <laughs> wow. Uh, agree to slightly agree. What made wow. you move? Okay. So I, I think fundamentally Islam cannot be reformed to be, um, you said, secular? Yeah. Um, but I believe Muslims can. The reason why I move to, to slightly agree is in some circumstances, I can see potentially a, a very strong hand of a state forcing the Islamic institutions within the country to adopt a sort of state version of that Islam. You sort of see this a little bit in France with French Islam in which Muslim organizations and particularly imams that are boosted by the French Republic are, are preach about a, a compatibility between la laicite of uh, French uh, Republican values and Islam. That is, you could argue, a very reformed version. So th that's why, that's really the only reason why I moved to, to slightly agree. Okay, go, go back to, the, I just want to flush some ideas. Can you go back to the neutral, please, both of you? Let's say there were some kind of weird conditions without going into it and it caused a diaspora. And let's say that the, how many people live in the UK? Uh, 60 million. Okay. So let's say that 10 million Jews came here. 
I would feel personally safe if 10 million Jews came to the UK. Move. Eric, you're on strongly agree. You, you actually even made room for him to move to the strongly agree. Andy? I'll stay at neutral. Really? Why? Why? Well, one, Jews aren't a monolith. You have people probably, I mean, most of, you know, speaking in, in, when you're in England or in America, most of the Jews that you meet are going to be moderate practicing Jewish people or they're secular or atheists even, but identify as Jewish. But there are very also radical Jewish sects and orthodox um, manifestations of that religion that are um, separatists and have very extremist views in regards to women and other groups of people. So the statement that you made doesn't specify which type of Jews. Uh, and for yeah. example, you know, having 10 million um Ultra-Orthodox, Extreme Hasids. Jews come in would be actually very destabilizing to society. Even in Israel, as their population has grown, that's been cha- causing huge political changes, also okay. cultural ones. Okay. Well. Right, la- last claim. Okay, can you go back to neutral? Uh, the most extreme Jews, the most extreme Jews, are just as bad in terms of a social level for society as the most extreme Muslims. Move. You're both on strongly disagree. Why? Um, Because if we look at the most extreme Muslims, they're involved in jihadi terrorism. They're involved, uh, if you look at the Muslim world, the civil wars that have occurred there in the last 10, 20 years, all of that suggests that this this is more violent ideology. Now, if you take the religious Zionist settler movement, for example, or you take, you know, the ultra-Orthodox are, they're not violent. Um, they are illiberal. Uh, you know, they're, they're not, this is not a, a group I'd want to see expanding in Britain. But, <laughs> but, um, or in Israel or anywhere else, even right. though they are going to because they have, you know, right. six or seven kids per woman. But um, if you take the religious Zionist settler element, I, I do think they are, a, a, you know, a malign element and they're violent and whatever. But do I think that they would perpetuate the same level of violence as Salafi jihadists or ISIS or no? So no. it's just a question of who's worse. Okay. You, you yeah, I would to like to answer. Um, so the, the most extreme fundamentalist Jewish communities are still very insular. They keep to themselves and they commit acts of violence within their own community, whereas uh, Islam is a proselytizing religion and the more fundamentalist it is, it's, it's more of a spreading force. So... Uh, for that reason, which is why there's a very big fundamental important difference between the two extremes. Cool. All right. Thanks, guys. Excellent.